in particular through its platform design choices. And the buy box is just an example of a design choice. So putting, for instance, in this case, the second seller into this prominent position. However, Amazon often competes as a seller on its own marketplace, so it could be within the set of sellers, and it could also self-select into the uh, buy box. And this could be an example of self-preferencing. Now, what, why is this important and what is the problem? So what we ask in our research project. So there could be many effects on the seller side, so the dimension of self-preferencing, competition for prominence, the fee pass-through, and many more. And there is a growing academic literature in computer scientists, economics, econ and law investigating this issue. What we argue is that the effects on the consumer side are relatively less investigated. And by consumer side, what I mean is dimension like awareness of the type of design consumers are interacting with, how this is gonna affect their search behavior, and ultimately their trust in the recommendations of the platform. So the buy box is nothing else than a recommendation made by an algorithm. The problem is that this algorithm is not transparent. Yet, we have anecdotal evidence suggesting that 80% of sales go through this button. So it has huge importance. Now, last year, we presented here a research agenda divided into three projects. So one on the seller side, unraveling persistence in the Amazon buy box algorithm and studying the effects on competition. One on consumer literacy and the usage of this buy box channel and one on personalization. Today, I'm gonna spend my remaining time very briefly on the second project on the consumer side. So what we do in this paper is to ask the following research question. So what do consumers know about the buy box? So their literacy of the design. How relevant is it for actual sales on the platform? And whether information on the buy box functioning, so providing more transparent information about this mechanism, can affect their search behavior. And how we do it? We design an online quasi-field experiment with real users on the real market. Amazon Marketplace. So one disclaimer, uh, this is not done in collaboration with Amazon. So we are doing it independently, and this is the reason why we cannot physically change the design of the platform and expose different consumers to different designs, but what we can do is to give them information provision treatments about the buy box. So informing them about its functioning and its lack of transparency. The main outcome of interest of the experiment being the share of buy box users. Then in the paper, we also have a theoretical model, and not gonna go through it, in which the main ingredients are the individual search cost and dimension trust dimension. So a parameter capturing the trust of consumers in the buy box recommendations. So very quickly, uh, let me go through how the the experiment works. So we are currently recruiting an heterogeneous pool of real users, and we are inviting them to make a purchase on the Amazon Italian marketplace. We go through a pre-experimental survey, which is a standard question, and then we move to the information provision step. So we expose different consumers to different treatment-specific information. So this is gonna be a within-subject design. Some of them are randomly assigned to a baseline treatment, so we give them some placebo information without mentioning the buy box at all. Then increasingly, in the partial information treatment, we give some information about the, the platform design and the functioning of the buy box. Additionally, in what we call the full information treatment, we also mention the lack of transparency buy box. And the goal is to also elicit this kind of trust dimension of the consumers. This is the core of the experiment. So the main part is a niche shopping task on the real marketplace. And what we did in the past few months was to, was to basically develop and code a software, which we call the web tracking and scraping software, that is allowing us to track what consumers do online and simultaneously to scrape all the information they see on the screen of, of their devices. This is basically our data collection. And this is how 
how it works. Basically, on the right-hand side, you see the screen of the software with some instruction. This software prompts the opening of a Google Chrome web page directly on Amazon. And here is basically the environment in which they can make their choices. And we are interested in understanding whether they will go directly through the buy box, whether they will in inspect all the other sellers, how many of them, whether they will choose one of them, or they will go back to the buy box. And to make everything as close as possible to the real world, we give them a reward for participating, but we also randomly extract some of them, and we will give them like the product they select in kind. So their, their choices have actual real consequences. So we are not eliciting hypothetical intentions to buy, but real intentions to buy of these consumers. And with these treatments, and recalling that the main outcome is the share of buy box, buy box users, uh, what they are going to do is to test the following hypotheses, which are built on the theoretical model that is in the paper. So we expect, uh, on the lines of the anecdotal evidence that we have, that most of the uninformed consumers will go straight through the buy box. We expect partial information to reduce the share of buy box users, and similarly, the full information treatment, with the additional hypothesis that the full information effect should be stronger. So more people should, should start searching, evaluating other sellers, and then choose one of them or eventually go to the buy box. So the results are going to be on two different dimensions, search and the final consumption choice. So as I said, we are now currently recruiting the participants, so we hope to have the paper out in a couple of months. And to summarize, uh, what I can tell you is that this experiment will allow us to quantify how relevant is this buy box channel and measure the consumer literacy on its functioning. And the key point is to investigate if more transparent information on the platform will affect consumer choices. And despite the limited sample size, this could be also a first step towards an analysis of personalization on the marketplace. But with this tool, in our hands, of course, we can scale it up and also by changing a little bit the code also apply it to different platforms. So for the moment, the main contribution is methodological. So having a tool that for us as external researchers allows us to study how consumers really interact with the platforms, their designs, and the algorithm that are behind these platforms. And our results could inform less intrusive and more viable policy recommendation for the regulator. Let me, let me conclude by saying that we gratefully acknowledge financial support from AF in Italy, of course, LEAR, and the Dirigenzia Foundation for Empirical Research in Germany. Thank you very much. by the project three years. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so unfortunately, we plan to, to be done uh, very well in advance. Uh, but with this kind of stuff, and especially rec recruiting subjects, uh, it is very difficult also to collaborate with recruitment platforms for data protection issues and, uh, I mean, some other aspects. So we are now at the last mile uh, preparing and Building the software was really time consuming, but yeah, now basically we are uh, good to go with it. Thank you. invite the three shortlisted uh, candidates for this year. Or you have the list. <laughs> uh, there is one that is uh, online. Okay, so we can start from him, maybe. Okay. Okay. 
Yes, he can. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Paolo, for the kind invitation, and congratulations on this big event. Actually, it's a very pleasure for me to be uh, not only here in the conference, but also as a part of the scientific committee. Um, the, the, the fact that Lear uh, strongly believe in supporting talent as uh, the last presentation of show what I think it's a very good choice. And I mean, we fully, in the, I'm speaking in the name of the full committee, we fully share and support this, uh, this approach towards young generations. Uh, my task is very brief today. I will introduce uh, Jean de la Perez, who is uh, connected uh, online. Hi, Jean. Um, he's a, a PhD candidate, third year at uh, the European University Institute of Florence. Um, his study is very interesting because it relates to remedies on uh, vertical mergers. Uh, the uh, project is full of very interesting uh, formulas for a lawyer. You know, it's not always easy to understand in full, but uh, I'm sure that, uh, that Jan will uh, briefly and um, in a very detailed way explain his research proposal. So uh, my conclusion stops here. Please, Jan, the floor is for you. Okay. So, uh, thank you for the opportunity to present uh, my research. So, my name is Yann Delapre, and I am a PhD candidate at the European University Institute. And my PhD dissertation is about uh, merger remedies, and in particular, divestiture. So, in this project, I am interested in the impact of upstream divestiture on bargaining power. And the starting point is that antitrust authorities often clear mergers that are associated with expected anti-competitive effects, conditional on the implementation of remedies. If you look at the US, for instance, between 2003 and 2012, more than 60% of the mergers that were associated with competition issue were actually cleared conditional on remedies. And in most cases, these remedies are structural remedies such as divestiture. So what's the divestiture? Let's say two manufacturers want to merge. The merger is approved, conditional on the merge entity, having to sell a set of bonds to an existing or new rival. And the idea of the, of the objective of the policy is to reduce post-merger concentration, thereby limit the ability of the merge entity to raise prices in the relevant market. If you zoom on relevant markets, most markets are actually vertically related. And empirically, the typical vertical market structure that you observe is well summarized uh, by this graph. So upstream, you have some manufacturers, downstream, some retailers, and then final consumers. In a vertically related market, each manufacturer directly sells its products at a wholesale price, let's say W, to the retailer, and then retailers sell to the final consumers. But so now, if you have an upstream merger, let's say with manufacturer one and two in this graph, and the antitrust authority evaluate this merger negatively, they can request a divestiture. So let's say they impose a divestiture, then the direct effect in that example of the divestiture is on wholesale prices. The effect on final prices the one that the antitrust authority care about, the one that is paid by final consumers uh, is indirect. And so the effect on retail prices is actually ambiguous and it depends in the uh, bargaining power that manufacturer and retailer uh, have. And you can think about situation in which retailers have so much bargaining power that what is happening upstream is irrelevant for final prices. You can also think about situation in which uh, you divest a bond to a rival that has a small market share, but high bargaining ability, and this might well increase wholesale and final prices. So in this project, I want to know what is the effect of upstream divestiture on bargaining power. And this question is key to understand the next question that is how oh, upstream divestiture affects uh, final prices and consumer surplus the question that policymakers uh, care about. So if you look at the literature, the relevance of divestiture is highly debated uh, by the antitrust community. For instance, if you look at uh, Coca and Waller, it's a recent policy paper in which they argue that um, it's better from a welfare point of view to directly block 
anti-competitive merger rather than imposing uh, remedies and include divestiture in the discussion. But my understanding on why uh, there is such a debate is because the limited evidence are actually available. And this is confirmed by Asker and Noke uh, in the Handbook of Industrial Organization. Um, last year, what they said is that in light of their prevalence, it is surprising how little is known theoretically and empirically about merger remedies. If you look at the small empirical literature on divestiture, the literature using only um, empirical work found that uh, after a divestiture, the price of a divested bonds can either decrease, which is what is observed in most of the cases, or it can increase. If you move to the uh, model that are used, there are two important limitations. The first one is that the vertical uh, important limitation. In order to do this, I will start from what I observe, and I will study a landmark merger for which we have no empirical evidence uh, published in the literature. That's the merger between Procter and Gamble and Gillette that is approved in October 2005, conditional on a divestiture of not only one brand, but three brands, Hyde Guard, Dry ID, and Soft and Dry. These brands are sold to an entrance in this product category that is ample, and the antitrust authority did not expect any cost efficiency. To reach my objective, I will um, use the following methodology. I will start with a theory-free approach, and I will look at the effects of the divestiture on final prices using an event study. In this literature, an important challenge is uh, to pick the right control group because any rivals taken in the control group might strategically react to the merger or divestiture. So let's say if the merger raises prices, any rivals might also react by raising prices and case that is uh, Procter and Gamble and Gillette are present in other markets in which there are no competition issue, uh, to be more specific, the shampoo markets. And I will pick as control group rivals that are in the shampoo market but not present in the uh, deodorants. Uh, using the fact that prices for shampoo and deodorant are actually very close and likely to trend uh, similarly. Then I will put some structure on the data. Uh, I will look at extend previous work by adding a sequential bargaining feature and uh, an endogenous buyer choice uh, as well. Then I will look at the effect on welfare and uh, I expect to derive new measures to describe how the bargaining weights are interacting with diversion ratio. And to be more specific here, if you look at the first order condition of this model, it's not trivial how actually the uh, anti-competitive effect are governed as there is a new element that are the bargaining weights that interact with the diversion ratio. So at this stage of this presentation, I would like to motivate more the two elements that I want to add and to do this, I will simply take a standard merger simulation model, pretend that I am a policymaker keeping data just from before. I will simulate a merger with divestiture, and I will compare the prediction of the model with what I actually, there is a contradiction, the model cannot uh, rationalize what I do observe. So first I compute average market share um, for each brand before the merger and after the merger and divestiture. So in blue, you see the average market share for the divested bond. And what I want to show is that before the merger, these brands are owned by um, Gillette, so manufacturer one that has one other brand. And after, they go basically on their own. So this divested brand goes from a large product portfolio to a relatively smaller one. So absence any cost efficiency, you would expect these prices for the divested bonds to decrease. The merger, and I compute the simulated effect, price effect, of a merger without divestiture and with divestiture. And in, in this table, I show you the price effect. When I simulate a merger but no divestiture, all prices are predicted to increase. 
if I simulate a merger with divestiture, um, you see two pro-competitive effects of a divestiture. Number one, the price of the merge entity are increasing, but less than when you have a merger without divestiture. And number two, the prices of all the divested brands are actually decreasing. So next question is, uh, if I take a standard merger simulation model, if I, if I look at the observed price effect, sorry, will, is it actually what I, is it actually uh, what I observe? That is, all divested brands are decreasing. And the answer is no. So in this slide, what I show are the event study plots associated with each uh, divested brand. So the effect of the divestiture on the price of the divested brand. And what you do, so the first, so these are event study plots. The first vertical line is the announcement of the merger. The second one is the approval of the merger. And the last one is the finalization with the divestiture. What you do see is that for brand B, prices are decreasing as predicted by the model. For brand D, I have limited evidence, but prices are also decreasing as predicted by the model. By contrast, if you look at brand serve, that prices are actually increasing, whereas the standard merger simulation model that is often used by practitioners predict that prices will decrease. And so this model is omitting one anti-competitive uh, channel that I do observe empirically. So what are the issues? Well, first, this model, the standard merger simulation model, assume that manufacturers directly sell their products to the final consumer. So they ignore retailer competition. But in reality, uh, a more realistic model, you do expect that retailers take into account the world, the change in the wholesale prices, and then within their product portfolio, it's likely that you observe that some prices are increasing and some other are decreasing, such, such that the retailer is reall reallocating demands toward the products for which the markup is the highest. The second issue is that the choice of the buyer is assumed to be exogenous. And this tends to overestimate the extent to which uh, the divestiture can remove the anti-competitive effect of the merge entity. In reality, it's likely that the merge entity selects the buyer of the divested bond that is the most profitable for the merge entity. So these two limitations are the two elements that I'm uh, taking on board in my projects. And so I'm trying to overcome this limitation in order to support effective merger remedy policy in vertical markets. So let me summarize my project uh, in one slide. I study an highly debated uh, topic that is merger remedies. In two sentences, the debate is the following. Most merger led to higher prices paid by final consumers. These mergers were associated with remedy, but the remedy policies were not able to block anti-competitive mergers. So in this project, I look at a new channel that is affecting divestiture policy, that is the vertical market structure. And I ask, what is the effect of upstream divestiture on bargaining power? The methodology I follow is relying not only on empirical work, but also on theory. I start with a reduced for first I provide or expect to provide reduced form evidences and a retro retrospective analysis of a landmark merger. And then I will use theory to investigate the effect on welfare, but also derive new measures that can be um, easily used by practitioners to implement relevant merger remedy policy. Thank you. Other one. Thank you very much, Jan, for that presentation. And I have the pleasure of introducing our second candidate, Or al Um or, And she's a lawyer and economist by training. She holds a Bachelor of Laws and a Bachelor's in Economics from Tel Aviv University. 
And prior to starting her, her studies for an LLM, she worked at the Israeli Competition Authority. So Or's project is entitled Cross-Regulation Enforcement, Suggested Doctrine for Application Improved Competition Law Enforcement in the Digital Age. And it's a truly very interesting research project that's trying to explore whether a framework can be proposed whereby competition that violates other regulations than competition law, such as data protection, environmental protection, and banking regulations. So a very topical, interesting, and important research project. Please, or the floor is yours. Thank you. Um, so um, thank you for the introduction. And I just want to mention that I currently work at a law firm in Israel. I finished my uh, master's degree. And also, <laughs> thank you, and as part of it, I developed this research proposal. So what you're going to see today is a bit more developed than the proposal that, is, um, was, that was submitted. Um, and the topic is cross-regulation enforcement, as mentioned, and it was um, conducted under the supervision of Professor David Busco uh, in the Axel Mosse in France. Um, so just to begin with, and it's mostly for the lawyers here, let's see your intuition regarding two scenarios that I would like to uh, present here and see how you feel about them as uh, competition uh, law professionals. So in the first scenario, there's a prominent digital multi-sided platform that collects user data in a way that constitutes a GDPR infringement. And subsequently, it gains a significant competitive advantage in the personalized advertising market and eventually monopolizes it. It might sound familiar to some of you. Uh, <laughs> the second situation is um, similar but different. We have Factory A is using a highly polluting technology without marking it, without sorry, marking its products accordingly. And let's assume it's an infringement of environmental regulation. This reduces Factory A production costs significantly, giving it a competitive advantage over its law-abiding competitors. Now, these two situations are similar in the way that they are not enforceable under competition law um, in the EU nor in Israel, um, in the EU that, that I understand, as far as I understand, but my uh, research proposal deals with the question, should they be able, um, should we let competition enforcement um, authorities enforce these kind of situations? And what is the reason that these kind of situations are not being enforced? The first situation is monopolization in the EU. Uh, we don't have an, a provision that prohibits monopolization. In the second one, the harm was to allegedly just competitors and not the competition. There is no monopolization, there is no collusion, and allegedly there is not a problem from competition law perspective. So we're gonna deal, um, first we're gonna discuss uh, the reason behind this, um, and it's the fear of type one errors um, by competition authorities. Um, the special case of cross-regulation infringements, which is this type um, that we presented. The problem that they entail, and then my research proposal of how uh, we should allow competition authorities um, to engage in this kind of, or to enforce against this kind of behaviors. Um, so, um, let me just move Jan a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Jan, I put you here. Uh, okay. Um, so, um, competition law enforcement is controlled by the fear of type one errors, and why, what do I mean when I say that? Um, so, enforcement of competition law coexists alongside this fear that we're gonna over intervene in, in the free market. So usually competition authorities would rather refrain from enforcement if it's possible, um, than if it means that the intervention is gonna be wrong. And usually the reason behind it is that the market is very, it's changing, it's ever changing, and no one can uh, foresee the future and say, well, what's gonna happen um, at the end? So we're really afraid that we're gonna intervene in a way that would chill the beneficial business activity, which result eventually is a social cost that we would like to um, prevent. And this, this kind of mentality led to a high threshold for initiating enforcement for competition authorities all over the world, specifically in the EU as well. It introduced, it's the reason we, one of the reasons we have the rule of reason and that this kind of rules put hard hurdles in front of competition authorities, they need to define, and I'll remind you the plenary session from this morning discussing the more economic approach. You need to define a relevant market, you need to provide an economically sound theory of harm, you need to prove the potential harm, and it usually means to, pr to pr prove the exclusion of as efficient competitor and just in order to um, impose a sanction. 
And in digital economy, it became a, a, bigger, a bigger problem because it's very hard. How do you define a market when you can't use the uh, hypothetic monopol monopoly case because you're in a zero price market? And what do you do when the currency um, is not money anymore, it's privacy? Um, how do you measure harm to consumers? So it's become very problematic, as we all know. But this, what is unique with the two scenarios that I presented, and in, in all these kind of situations um, that I called cross-regulation infringements, is that in these cases there will be no social cost for a mistake by the competition authority. Let's say that they would over-intervene and actually no harm to competition was to arise from that kind of, 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 uh, of an act. No harm would happen if they'll prevent it. The reason behind this is that we as a society already decided that the cost of that activity outweigh its benefits. So we want to prevent it anyway. Think of the example that I gave from the GDPR. If a platform is collecting data from users in a way that infringes the GDPR, we as a society already decided when we put that provision in the GDPR that we don't want this kind of act to take place. So in this kind of situation, Regardless of the level of harm to competition, what is the just justification not to let competition authorities when they think they should enforce because they think there might be some even minimal harm to competition, why should we stop them from enforcing in this kind of situations? Um, it, it's all, all, not just privacy, it can be also banking environment and every type of specialized regulation. So because uh, I'm a lawyer, I like definitions, um, so just look at the formal definition. Um, what is cross-regulation infringements that this kind of um, the framework I'm suggesting is, is supposed to deal with? So it's an act or an omission to act by an undertaking which constitutes an infringement of a specialized regulation to which the undertaking is subjected, specifically non-competition regulation that is, and has an additional impact on the competitive process structure or outcome of a non-enforceable magnitude, I mean non-enforceable by competition authorities. So what is the problem? Of course, externalities. In this type of infringement, eventually, we're gonna have suboptimal level of deterrence. And why is that? Two reasons. Suboptimal sanction level or suboptimal probability of being sanctioned. Why suboptimal sanction level? Because usually in this kind of infringements, we can't enforce and make the infringer internalize the harm to competition part. Okay, With, even if it's a small level of harm to competition, let's say it eliminated one competitor from the market, okay, and it gained, let the, the infringer gain because of that some benefit, we can uh, assume, definitely if it monopolized the market, and it's not gonna be sanctioned because it's only gonna uh, get the GDPR sanction. The second reason um, is suboptimal probability of being sanctioned, and that's even a worse case um, when the privacy protection authority, sorry, when the privacy protection authority uh, won't enforce um, at all, and it can happen because the, regu the new regulator is young, it's weak, it's captive. Um, of course, it's not always, or it, it maybe it made a mistake. Um, and it's especially important in digital, in digital economy when this kind of situation, um, this kind of regulators are especially young. Um, so what I suggest is that we let competition authorities um, pick up the ball in this kind of situation and help with the internalization of the social cost um, by enforcing against this specific negative effect on competition. And how we just need to let them initiate enforcement procedures in this kind of situation. So, um, in short, if there's a GDPR provision and the Privacy Protection Authority does not enforce, and the Competition Authority thinks or finds that it has some, even the lowest level of harm to competition, and it finds it suitable for it to invest um, its uh, resources to this kind of procedure, we should let them. Um, how we can introduce it into competition law. Um, I have uh, three options. I'm not sure which one is right. I guess the research would uh, help me decide. Um, I'm especially fond of the first and the, thir and the third one. <laughs> I don't really uh, like the second one, and I'll explain why. Um, so the first one is a new provision into competition law. Just introduce, like, like you have 101, 102, you're gonna have I don't know, I guess we have 103 and it's something else, but you understand the idea. Um, and it was just saying that um, cross infringements with any minimal harm to competition, competitor or consumer, regardless of dominant position or collusion, um, are a competition authority issue. 
The second option is to, to look at it as a per se um, competition not on the merits and therefore uh, abuse of dominance, but it will narrow it only for monopolic, monopolistic situations. And the last option is to narrow it to monopolization cases alone. And here we can say that only when we see causality between the cross infringement and a, and a monopolization uh, was reached at the end, then we should um, let competition authorities enforce. Um, which one is the optimal framework? Uh, I think that's the discussion um, that I, it's not the, but it's one of them. Um, what are the advantages of a cross enforcement over other types? So first of all, it solves the problem of cross infringements and the under deterrence. So that's the main thing, but um, it has another advantage and it, the, the, the fact that we'll give competition authority, additional agency, the ability to enforce um, leads to bureaucratic redundancy that has its own advantages. And there's a lot of uh, literature about that. Um, it reduces public expenditure and monitoring costs over the agencies because we have both of them dealing, kind of monitoring each other by default, um, or at least partly, of course. Um, it can enhance productive interagency competition, improving both agencies. Um, it can remedy it, the errors of the special ed agency. Let's say if the privacy protection authority dropped the ball and didn't enforce, the competition authority can enforce uh, instead. And it also uh, has the ability to mitigate the risk of capture and also reduce the likelihood of capture because now I need to capture both um, regulators. Uh, mitigate the risk because even if the, the Privacy Protection Authority does not enforce because of captive, because it is captive, then the Competition Authority, which is harder to uh, capture, is um, enforcing again um, instead. And uh, as mentioned, because there is no type one error costs here, and we can't chill, over chill, over intervene in the market, then it actually has a very low cost. Um, but of course, um, competition, that it not necessarily have to be competition authorities. We could choose other agencies, but why competition authorities, um, why I find them to be the most efficient one. Low information costs, specific, specifically competition authorities. They're familiar with different industries, regulators, and agencies. Um, there's lower likelihood for capture because of that nature. They they're, don't work closely with a single industry. And they're relatively strong, respected, and established, so it's gonna work for all undertaking sides, especially in these new um, economies or big tech economies. And specifically from the narrow uh, point of view of competition, um, it's another tool to deal with digital economy, as we all seen also, or a twist of that we saw in the German Facebook case. Um, but there are, of course, cross other costs and concerns um, that I should deal with in this research. And it's the error cost of applying the specialized regulation, let's say the GDPR, by the non-specialized competition authority. Um, but this type one error cost of the special regulation is different than the one that we have in competition because they are preventable and um, I'm gonna suggest uh, how. Um, we can have conflicting enforcement procedures that reduce the effectiveness of both regulations um, because maybe they have kind of um, different approaches. Um, re regarding the regulation. It can increase uncertainty in the market, who will sanction me as an undertaking and how much. And, and hot potato game between agencies that would, would lower the accountability. Let's say there's this highly political case and now no one would deal with because they say, well, the other one will take care of that uh, instead. Um, and it might um, increase power imbalances between agencies, um, it might weaker new agencies, now that competition authority might take high profile cases instead of them, and um, it might give too much power to competition authority, which they might later abuse. Um, so just, that's like the, the sum, summary, um, not exactly the summary, but how I, the framework, the general framework and limitations that I suggest to implement if this kind of decision was to take place and let competition authority enforce in order to deal or at least to offset some of the concerns um, I mentioned. So first, we should limit the scope of the type of infringements that cross infringement should, um, let's say, oversee. Only consumer oriented regulatory provisions, thank you, um, that competition authorities usually are more accustomed to deal with because they um, deal with consumer and markets. Um, mandatory consultation with a specialized regulator um, 
and maybe even uh, treating their uh, position as a default position, but not giving them veto power because of that fear of captivity. It would enforce competition, um, would, uh, sorry, would force competition authorities to weigh in the privacy protection authority uh, opinion. Instruction as a primary sanction instead of uh, a, a fine or can be, uh, rebut, rebut, is, can be rebut by the uh, infringer, um, mainly not to make competition authority try and prove the level of harm when, as we mentioned, we don't have um, the ability to do so um, often, and uh, consolidate enforce, enforcement procedures if the agencies are um, willing to do so. Thank you so much for listening. Uh, thank you, Orr. Uh, I have the pleasure of introducing the third finalist, Philip Hausbach. Uh, he received his bachelor's degree from, in economics from the University of Bonn and a master's degree from the Toulouse, Toulouse School of Economics. He's currently a third year student in the doctoral economics program at the U U uh, European University Institute in Florence. Philip's research proposal is titled Internet Infrastructure and Competition in Digital Markets. It examines a highly topical area of digital markets, but from a largely unexplored perspective. Uh, his plan is to investigate market power that emanates from proprietary internet infrastructure. Uh, the committee felt that this is, the proposal has the potential not just to add to our kind of understanding of markets, but uh, Philip, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. I'm Philip Hansbach now a fourth year researcher at EUI in Florence, and I'm very thrilled to talk to you today about internet infrastructure and competition in digital markets. I got the idea for this project last summer when I learned about the role that big tech firms play in the infrastructure of our internet. It is not just networks are connected by internet service providers, but instead, um, over the last 10 years, um, proprietary infrastructure has complemented the public internet. These are infrastructures owned by firms such as Microsoft, Google, or Meta. And um, did you know, for example, that these three firms own or co-own about 30% of submarine cables that go on online these years, through which a majority of our internet traffic travels? Well, why should we care about this? There is a competition reason and a regulation reason. The competition reason is that these proprietary networks confer cost or quality advantages. So a vertically integrated firm that owns proprietary networks and also offers digital services can do so at a lower cost or higher quality than its rivals. Yet um, competition authorities are only um, slowly waking up to this issue and scratching the surface in their analysis. The, uh, the regulation reason is that uh, the net neutrality debate is back on the table. Earlier this year, EU Competition Commissioner Vesaya said that players who generate a lot of traffic that then enables their business should make a fair contribution to telecommunication networks. What this means is that big tech firms should pay more to telecommunication firms that invest heavily in internet infrastructure, which is a shift on the old policy stance where anyone could send their content over the internet free of termination charges. But this was uh, largely developed in a world where generally speaking, an internet service provider and, say, a provider of a search engine were two very different things. So this leads to my research question, what is the impact of vertical integration into internet infrastructure by tech platforms on market power in digital markets? A brief summary of what I do in this paper, um, I have uh, a mainly theoretical model that combines elements from two-sided market theory and vertical uh, theory there is an upstream player, which I simply call you. Think of this as a firm providing some important piece of infrastructure that you need for digital services, for example, a content delivery network. This could be a firm such as Akamai or Limelight. They invest in this infrastructure, and then there are two downstream firms that rent access to this infrastructure. These two firms then compete downstream in a pretty generic platform market, in a standard setup uh, that is competition for a competitive bottleneck with two sides that I just call consumers and advertisers for illustration. These two downstream platforms bilaterally negotiate access fees with uh, player U depending on their outside options. And um, downstream, I say these two firms are asymmetric. There is a content platform, a big tech firm such as Google, 
that has the scale to invest in a proprietary network and a collection of smaller fringe players, which I summarize as a player FP, that can only rent infrastructure access from you. And what am I going to find, or what are some of my preliminary results at this point? Um, most importantly, I find results on infrastructure investments, and namely the incentives to invest increase both for the upstream player, the infrastructure firm, and for the vertically integrated platform CP, when in equilibrium CP's network is larger than use. The reason for this is that CP manages to escape competition by providing more services than its rival, uh, but paradoxically, the reason for you is that it loses its strategic role of pushing uh, CP into the region where it has market power, yet it can contribute um, to CP's profit on the region where it has market power. And this is an effect that I will call commodification, and I'm going to show you in detail why this is the case and why it makes sense to call it that. Um, to just briefly go into one extension, I show that value charging, which is currently difficult and not really possible for internet service providers, but possible for some infrastructure players like content delivery networks, leads to lower consumer prices, while extending net neutrality to such players would lead to foreclosure and higher consumer prices, contrary to what big tech lobbyists are currently trying to push in the policy debate. Just very briefly, there is an existing and mostly settled literature on net neutrality, but it largely precedes the rise of proprietary networks. Only in recent years have economists become to, uh, begun to become more interested in the economics of internet infrastructure. The existing literature on vertical relations in two-sided markets, unfortunately, does not help very much for this question, because this is mostly focused on exclusive dealing between a platform and one of their platform sites. For example, what happens if Netflix secures an ex exclusive show? By contrast, in my paper, the upstream industry is separate from the platform market. I draw a lot on the computer science and um, network, uh, um, networking uh, systems uh, literature to understand what proprietary networks do, how they confer these competitive advantages, and how they can result in effects on innovation and network fragmentation. So I'm not going to spare you the math. We're going to jump right into the model. Um, as for actions and timing, this is a sequential game of full information between three players, U, CP, and FP. At the first stage, U, so the infrastructure firm and the vertically integrated firm CP simultaneously invest in a private network of size XI, where I stands for the investing player. Each of them has their own cost function for infrastructure investment, which is increasing and convex. At the second stage, the two platforms, CP and FP, rent access to use infrastructure via Nash bargaining. Both of these happen independently, so in the base model, I say there's no congestion, so access is non-rival. And in the base model, the fringe platform also cannot rent access. Uh, to the um, integrated players' um, infrastructure. This is all addressed in extensions. At the final stage, the two platforms set downstream prices to consumers and advertisers and collect payoffs. So now maybe you're wondering, how does infrastructure size determine demand in the downstream market? For this, I have this picture. I say that the cumulative infrastructure that a platform has access to determines the size of the market it can address. If more infrastructure means that you can deliver services to more consumers with a lower latency, higher bandwidth. It means that if uh, you have access to more infrastructure, you can provide the service to more people. So um, this is shown here. The fringe player only rents access from U, so that is XU, that is this arrow. So FP can serve this measure of demand, while um, the content platform, the vertically integrated player, puts its own infrastructure on top so it can serve this larger part of demand. Over the range over which they overlap, there is competition. Over the range where CP stands alone, it has monopoly pricing power. Think of this area as a very simple service that does not require very sophisticated infrastructure, such as email. Email is very tolerant of latency. And indeed, there's a lot of different competitors for email and generally low consumer prices. Over this range, you could imagine something like cloud gaming, Google Stadia, that requires very sophisticated infrastructure, and uh, Google correspondingly has fewer competitors there and can presumably set higher prices in an economic sense. 
um, I introduce some more notations to define payoffs if we have direct transfers T between a platform and an upstream firm and consumer prices PJK for platform J on segment K as well as per user advertisement revenues of R and if we define consumer demand for a platform J on segment K as QJK and for simplicity say that marginal costs are zero, we end up with these very simple um, payoff functions where U simply collects the fees and pays its investment cost. The fringe platform um, collects revenues from consumers that it attracts and pays the fee. And it looks very similar for the vertically integrated firm, only that it is active on both segments and pays the fee and its investment cost. Then we can go by backward induction. At the third stage, downstream competition, also very simple. I say on the competitive segment, there's Bertrand competition. In equilibrium, both platforms will set equal prices, and I say, in this case, they split consumers equally. On the monopoly segment, the um, uh, vertically integrated firm can collect all the consumers, attract all the demand, as long as it doesn't exceed consumers' willingness to pay V. At the second stage, I say there's Nash bargaining but where platforms and you split the difference be, uh, between the profit with and without access to XU. Two important assumptions come into play here. I say as an outside option, the vertically integrated firm can use its network as a substitute to XU. This is important to define what would happen off path. And note that this implies that the marginal value of XU depends on whether um, CP has the larger or the smaller network. Assumption two is that you cannot make an offer contingent on excluding arrivals, so this is not an example of Nash and Nash bargaining. I say this because first, it would be a very blatant violation of antitrust law, and second, um, it would make the model very trivial because for all but most extreme parameter values, this would directly lead to foreclosure. But I'm going to relax this assumption in a few slides in case you don't like it. So just to have some results, looking at a, a subgame perfect Nash equilibrium, I show that the marginal value of investment for the vertically integrated firm and the infrastructure firm is larger, when in equilibrium the network size of the vertically integrated firm is uh, larger. And the intuition for this is that if CP has the larger network, and ca it can provide services with market power, even without use network. So at the margin, use additional infrastructure investment expands CP's profit on the most lucrative segment of the monopoly region. An alternative way to think about this is that as long as um, use network is smaller, FP's ability to uh, competitively constrain the vertically integrated firm is limited. And this means that at the margin, each additional unit of investment by you um, adds the same amount of value to um, uh, the profit of the vertically integrated firm. And that's why I say use network becomes a commodity here. That's why I say its network becomes commodified. Now you might be wondering, okay, we have more investment in one case than the other. Is there too much investment in total or too little? Um, so that means we look at total welfare. As I show that total investment is below the socially optimal level, independent of who has the larger network, but total investment is closer to the social optimum in the case where the vertically integrated firm has the larger network. In the interest of time, I'm skipping the um, intuition for this. It's very similar to what was shown before. Let's just very briefly talk about net neutrality. You might be wondering, what does this all tell us about net neutrality? Because this model does not contain the last mile where internet service providers typically have monopoly access to residential buildings. However, two things I would like to point out. First of all, certain infrastructure providers and industries such as content delivery networks successfully lobbied to be exempt from net neutrality regulation. There is no law of nature that this should not apply to them. And second, I think of this whole phenomenon of proprietary networks really as second best optimization by big tech firms in a world with a net, uh, net neutrality status quo. Google cannot buy a fast lane on the public internet, so it simply puts down its own fast lane by building its proprietary infrastructure. To explore this idea a little bit in the model, I say, okay, in the model, you now has to grant access under equal prices to both players. And what happens then is, under this definition of net neutrality, you will set a price that extracts the whole surplus of the vertically integrated firm. It will find it always profitable to exclude um, FP. And the intuition for this is that the highest price that the French platform is willing to pay is lower than use revenue from only serving the vertically integrated firm. U has no interest in downstream competition as it destroys industry profit. 
So in this case, um, also consumer prices would increase and we would have foreclosure. So let's wrap this up. This is really just a first attempt and perhaps in some elements a little bit crude to translate the rise of proprietary networks into economics. I fold very complicated tech ecosystems into a very simple demand structure and some obvious caveats that I admit are that um, I do not discuss here much the role of upstream competition and the consumer ISP relationship. However, I uh, do think that the model helps to link physical internet infrastructure to competition in digital markets. Even though I work with a very generic uh, digital market, I think this can help and force us investigating a specific digital market to pick out which elements are important to them to understand the role of uh, infrastructure. I also believe that the commodification argument is relevant beyond digital markets. If you compare the situation for automotive, this is a policy, dis uh, policy discussion that is very active in Germany, where I'm from, also in the US and Japan. Um, now, as tech firms vertically integrate into automotive, some people fear uh, that the automotive um, suppliers, the OEMs, will just become mere yeah, suppliers to the platforms who will reap all the rewards if they control the valuable part in the value chain, the data and the platform stage. And my model implies that at least the static incentives are there to accommodate this kind of entry by vertical firms. Um, but we can discuss this, how, how far, how heroic this uh, extension is. Finally, I would like to say that with our current technological development towards more localized edge computing and decentralized 5G networks, this is only going to become more important in the future. So I think the competition world should uh, become more aware of the role of internet infrastructure to analyze digital markets. Thank you very much. I hope so. Good. Thank you. Uh, uh, first, uh, congratulations to Paolo and Lear for establishing this uh, wonderful recognition. Uh, and you understand, and it's reflected in this, that uh, the quality of a competition law system uh, depends vitally on the quality of the intellectual infrastructure that supports it. And that infrastructure depends crucially on the quality of young scholars who are coming into the system. And by recognizing that, uh, you draw attention to a a vital ingredient of good policy making over time. And you also give us the opportunity to see excellent proposals, which uh, Jan, Orr, and Philip have, have given us here. Uh, uh, I, I find it exciting on a, on a Wednesday afternoon uh, to see work that's this good and this promising and so directly relevant to policy making in the, in the future. Uh, and in doing that, uh, you show us the face of a better future. And at a time when we need hope, uh, I think we just saw it in, in many ways. So to turn to the, the candidate we have chosen. I'm sorry? Once again, he is watching over all of us. Thank you. <laughs> a position he likes, I think. Um, and among these uh, three wonderful proposals uh, and the uh, the, all the candidates should be, should be so proud, but especially the, the one I'm about to read because uh, uh, this person surpassed a wonderful field and the, the winner this year is uh, our last presenter, Philip Hanspach. And we, and we look forward to the continuing exposition of your work. You, you realize this is a form of indentured servitude and you will have to come back <laughs> every year. <laughs> but we look forward to that. Thank you, Paolo. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much to all of you and to the, to the audience. So the first day is over. <laughs> Fortunately, we now have the, the walking tour. There is a nice tour that if you, if you want, that brings you uh, in, the, in the area, visiting the area. And then we'll have the cocktail at the Palazzo Cesi. If you don't know where it is, you can ask at the registration desk. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs>